Um, some of us up here know how hard it is to make that transition from the field to the broadcast booth, so congratulations on doing that. Uh, you've done such a great job at that, people forget that you were a good baseball player. And not only that, you could hit. You're a little different than Bob Euchre, who won this award. You know, you could hit. I never had the opportunity to work with Tim, but we got close once. In 1989, we're in, doing the World Series there in San Francisco with the A's. And just when Tim and Al Michaels was throwing down to me, the earthquake hit. So I don't know if that was an omen or what, but Tim and I never had the opportunity to work together again. So, but it's, it's a great honor for me, Tim, to make this presentation. Would you join me here? It is an honor to present the 2012 Ford C. Frick Award to Tim McCarver. Tim has been in baseball his entire life, and his ability to analyze the game has earned him the highest honor he could receive as a broadcaster. Making the transition from the playing field to the broadcast booth came naturally to Tim, and his achievements over the last 30 years of baseball broadcasting have earned him national praise. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of the 2012 Ford C. Frick Award, Mr. Tim McCarver. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. I saw Frank Robinson at breakfast today, and I said, Frank, I'll try to be brief. He said, you? <laughs> lot like with Bob, the primary reason that I'm standing here is my love for a game, baseball. And preparing for this weekend, I was reminded of the introduction uh, to my book, forget the commercial pop here. I, it was baseball for brain surgeons and other fans. I wrote these words about 15 years ago, and they still hold true today. And I'll quote, I was signed, I was traded, I was waived, I was released. I played it and plied it. I was angered by it disappointed myself because of it, gladdened and heartened by it. I was cheered in parades, I was booed off the field, I was treated with silent indifference. I was on world champions and cellar dwellers. I was a hero and I failed miserably. I felt on top of the world and like I wanted to crawl under a rock. I spiked and was spiked, took out hard, and was taken out hard. I was hit by this little white rat more times than I can count. I hit it hard, I hit it weakly. I lifted it, grounded it, popped it, popped it, and lined it. I hit it fa fair and foul while realizing there was nothing fair about it. Baseball, I've been thrilled about it and wearied by it, but more than anything else, I've lived it and always loved it. And I've been talking about it for many years, 32 to be exact. While learning how to play the game, I was learning how to think the game. And that was the basis for my learning how to explain the game years later. As a catcher, you understand that you see everything back there. You see the choreography going on behind the pitcher of the second baseman and the shortstop. I can still see Henry, Henry Aaron come up to the plate, put his hard hat on, and step up to the plate, and before the first pitch only, he would clear his throat <clears throat> before clearing the bases. <laughs> I can still see Willie May's manicured nails when I was giving signs. That's right manicured nails, looking out at your pitcher, giving signs, and Willie has his hands right in front of you. I never saw that before or since. 
Billy Williams of the Chicago Cubs, and I told Billy last night I was going to tell this story, and he said he can, confirmed it. <clears throat> Billy would put a, a half a stick of gum in his mouth every time he left the third base dugout at Wrigley Field. He'd get to the batter's box, he'd take one practice swing, and then he'd spit the gum in the air and take another swing at it. In 12 years, I never saw him miss the gum. <laughs> never. He'd always hit it toward the visiting dugout at Wrigley Field. <laughs> never missed it. And I remember the awesome power of Mickey Mantle in the 1964 World Series. When he'd swing and miss, he'd give that, oh, he was in pain. His osteomyelitis and bad knees were acting up. But when he made contact, as he did on the first pitch, the bottom of the ninth at Yankee Stadium in game three, a knuckleball from Barney Schultz, and he hit it so high and so far and so high. It's like it, it never came down. I was so proud of myself for calling a pitch that went that far. <laughs> As a catcher, I also owe a debt of gratitude <clears throat> to Bill Dickey, the Hall of Fame catcher. He recruited me and scouted me in high school, and I almost signed with the New York Yankees. Almost. And Bill during the process of scouting me, gave me a list of things that catchers should do with the pitching staff. And the one thing I remember more than anything else, he said, be a pitcher's friend. And I must have taken him at his word because two of my best friends are behind me today in the stands, or in, behind me. And that's Bob Gibson and Steve Carlton. What a privilege. <clears throat> I've got to tell you this, uh, this one story about, about Bob. I've only been to one induction. That was back in 1994. As you know, Steve was uh, inducted along with Phil Rizzuto. And I was the last speaker at the dinner the night before the induction ceremony. I was so pleased to be there. And I got up and I said, if Carl Hubble goes down in the history of the game as having the best screwball, Sandy Koufax the best curveball, and arguably Nolan Ryan the best fastball, then Steve Carlton will go down in history, baseball history, as having the best slider in the history of the game. There's no question about that. <laughs> However, there might have been a question. Lefty and I are hugging, and over Steve's right shoulder, I see this familiar figure swimming through the crowd. And it took him about two and a half minutes to get there. And it was number 45, Bob Gibson. And he stands about six inches from my face, and he says, the best left-handed slider <laughs> in the history of the game. Gibson-esque. In front of me today, I've mentioned Steve and Bob and all these magnificent Hall of Famers behind me. But in front of me today is someone I want to thank for the direction my life took in the latter years of my career as a player. It was in 1977 when Bill Giles, who was then the, the business manager of the Philadelphia Phillies, asked me what I was going to do with, my rest of my, with the rest of my life. I said, Bill, I'm like everybody that's ever played the game. I think I can play forever. Don't you know that? And he said, let's be realistic. What are you going to do with the rest of your life? And I thought about it, and, and I said, you know, we, we players, we say, well, we'd kind of like to try broadcasting, try to give it a shot. And Bill said, here's what I'll do. 
We'll give you a one-year contract as a player. You can play as long as your, um, as your ability allows you to play. And then we'll give you a two-year contract for the first two years after you retire. And I really thank Bill Giles for the vision he had because I didn't have the same vision he had. Thank you, Bill. Bill is here today. Where are you? <clears throat> In 1980, my life of observation moved from behind the plate and into the Phillies broadcast booth. I was with a unique group of professionals. Har Harry Callis uh, was the play-by-play -play announcer, Hall of Famer now. Andy Musser was a gentleman's gentleman. Richie Ashburn was inducted in 1995. And Chris Wheeler. Chris Wheeler had a weekend series with the Philadelphia Phillies, and he and Renee drove up to be with me tonight and today. And I've got to say that he is the most selfless person I, <clears throat> I have ever run into in broadcasting or really any other field. Wheels, where are you? There you are, pal. <clears throat> In 1983, I moved to the New York Mets booth and began a 16-year career with the Mets. That was the happiest and most exciting years of my broadcasting life. And I'd like to thank Frank Cashin, uh, Assistant General Manager Al Harrison, for hiring me. Frank Cashin, of course, the architect of those great Met teams in the 80s. And believe me, during those years, they owned New York. Make no mistake about it. I was teamed with such great voices as Ralph Kiner, Steve Zabriskie, and Gary Thorne. Gary was right over there. Gary's going to be the host tomorrow, the MC. Ralph Kiner and I knew we had something special. As Gary Cohen says, he's the terrific play-by-play -play announcer now for the New York Mets. He says, Ralph Kiner is most comfortable in his own skin. And I've got to say, I know Ralph is watching today, and I've got to tell you, Ralph, for 16 years, it was a privilege and an honor to work with you. Thank you. Ralph, of course, a Hall of Famer. I've sat next to the giants in our industry, such as Dick Enberg, and Keith Jackson during the 1986 playoffs, Houston and the Mets. I've worked with Sean McDonough, Bobby Mercer, Tom Brenneman, Dick Stockton, all good friends and thorough professionals. Bob Costas and I did our first network game together. It was first for Bob, first for me. In 1980, the Boston Red Sox against the California Angels at the Big A in Anaheim. We went to about 6% of the country, and Bob's uncle Lenny was our only critic at the end of the game. We went down to the trucks, and Bob's uncle Lenny said, you guys were all right. I'd like to thank Bob Costas, who's in London, boning up for the 2012 Olympics, and thank Bob for his years of friendship. My big break came in 1985 when I was paired with, on ABC with Jim Palmer and the incomparable Al Michaels to do my first World Series. I got a text from London today and Al Falfa, uh, and I've got to tell you, Al, uh, I, I've told a lot of people, I've told you many, many times that I learned more about television from, uh, than, from you than anyone. And that was while becoming a lifelong friend in the process, and I thank you, Al, for everything. Thank you. <clears throat> My pairing with legends continued, and in the early 90s, 90 and 91 to be precise, on CBS, I worked and was paired with Jack Buck.
the incomparable Jack Buck also. And what a magnificent segue five years later that I'm working with Joe Buck in 1996 for our first year at Fox, the first of 17. And I've got to tell you that I found this out about Joe. It's in the genes, folks. It's in the genes. How proud Jack was and would have been to see how far Joe has come and how far he's going to go. No telling. Joe Buck, everyone knows about your talents, obviously, and your off-the-charts sense of humor. And believe me, it's off-the-charts. I get paid to be entertained working with Joe Buck. But only true friends know about your sentimentality, your sensitivity, and your real loyalty. You're an awesome talent, but you're a better friend. Joe, please stand up. I'd also like to acknowledge Ed Gorin of Fox Sports, his last year with Fox, what a friend he's been over the last 23 years for me. We knew each other, worked together at CBS, and we have continued to do so at Fox Sports. My longtime agent, Bob Rosen, my longtime writing collaborator, Danny Perry. Today is also such a joy for me because my family is here, represented by my oldest daughter, Kathy. Kath, please, please, you can stand up. This is fine. Kathy, Kathy, my oldest daughter, her husband, Matthew. Matt, please. And my intelligent, adorable, humorous, uh, perhaps could be the president one day, grandchildren, Bo Root, Bo, stand up. Come on now, we worked on this. And Lee Root. Lee? All right. <laughs> oh. Also, my, my wife of 34 years, Ann McCarver, and though she's not here today, she was supposed to bring my youngest daughter up, Kelly, from Philadelphia. They're both ill. They're trying to get better and get well because Ann is the biggest reason that I'm up here today. Thank you for your life of love and dedication, Annie. <laughs> Joe Morgan mentioned the 1989 World Series. And as I received this tremendous honor today, I can't help but recall the most lasting memories of the World Series that I've done. And right, the first one is 1989, when Al and Jim and Joe and I uh, were shocked, like the Bay Area, and we had a chance to experience the resiliency and courage of the people in the Bay Area on October 17th. 1989 at 5.04 p.m. We were on the air when that happened. We thought nothing would be as catastrophic, as tough to stomach as that World Series won by the A's in four games. And Tony La Russa, by the way, the manager of the A's that year. And then 2001 hit after 9-1-1. The Yankees go home. They play games four and five, trailing by two runs in the bottom of the ninth inning, two games in a row, games four and five. They're down two games to one to the Arizona Diamondbacks. They come back with two, two out, two run homers in consecutive nights to tie the Diamondbacks and win it in extra innings. Unbelievable only to go back to Arizona and see the Diamondbacks mount a comeback of their own 
when they came back not only against the Yankees, but against the, the greatest pitcher in the history, the greatest bullpen, the greatest reliever, I finally got it right, the greatest reliever in the history of the game, and that, of course, Mariano Rivera. And the Diamondbacks won it. And then last year happened. And the Cardinals clinch a playoff berth the last day of the season. How did this happen? I think I've said those words before or like that. How did game six happen? As Joe miraculously recalled his father's call uh, in game six of the 1991 World Series when Kirby Puckett with a home run on a 3-0 count against Atlanta, won it for Minnesota, and Jack said, we'll see you tomorrow night. And eerily, the same words came out of Joe's mouth that night of game six in St. Louis. We'll see you tomorrow night. I've put game six of last year's World Series in the top three, and the more I think about it, I don't know any two games that can top that. So I've moved it right up to the top of the list, as far as I'm concerned. The greatest World Series game ever played, and the Cardinals, out of nowhere, win their 11th World Championship. <clears throat> Frank Robinson's probably thinking, you? Finally, those of us in and around the game know that the state of Major League Baseball is strong and the future is bright. But one thing that disturbs me and others in and around the game is that the presence of African American players in the big leagues has plummeted from about 28% in 1975 to just over 8% today. It's very disturbing. I've used the word opportunity several times today, and I believe to keep America's pastime strong, we need to provide opportunities to our best young African-American athletes so they will consider baseball as much of an option as other sports. That's, a, that's wonderful. <clears throat> well, in order to do this, we need land. We need real estate. I learned the game in Memphis, Tennessee, on long ago fields. And this year, I've had the privilege of donating a meaningful amount of money to help build a ballpark or ballparks in Memphis specifically for inner city kids to play baseball. <clears throat> the hope is that some of these African-American kids will become Major League Baseball players, and maybe a few will have second careers as broadcasters, and maybe, just maybe, even be honored as I am here today with the Ford C. Frick Award from the Baseball Hall of Fame. Thank you very much.